Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to another Q and A. Um, yeah. So this is this has been this is number twenty one, right? That's a cool number. Twenty one question answer sessions. Um, I'm actually surprised that I've been able to do as many of these as I have because you know what happened. Um, used to be that Saturday was one of my big teaching days and, and it's starting to swing back in that direction again. And if it does, we'll have to figure out something else to do for the question and answer sessions. Right. Um, but one by one, the, the Saturday students either moved days or moved. I have one Saturday student that moved to Virginia, um, and yeah, so now the Saturdays are open. And I just thought that um, we'd be doing this like more sporadically. Now, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about real quick before we go on is that um, I've counted so far five days, four days, Saturdays between now and the first of the year um, that I won't be able to do this for sure. They're not coming up yet. I think the first one is on the 16th. I'm doing the Renaissance Festival that day. Renaissance Festival is all day. Um, we start at, so I leave the house at about 5.30 in the morning. And then um, I've got a gig that night. So it's like all day. Um, it's a two hour drive for me from here to get the Renaissance Festival. Anyway, what news do I have for you today? Um, you know what I'm excited about is we've been selling compositions. You know, music sales is a seasonal thing. There's different times of the year when people want music. And this is the time of the year where you got two things going on. You got people buying Christmas music, right? And, and I've been selling some of that. But it's also a time of the year when people are looking for solo contest, solo and ensemble. And I've written a lot of trumpet ensemble music. So I'm averaging right now for the last five days, um, I think about four or five sheet music sales a day, which that doesn't sound like a lot. But um, when it's consistent like that, day after day after day, you know, that's not enough to live on. And that's kind of um, something what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the first question I got was about what you should charge. And now this person was asking about lessons. But um, I think everything should be, it's not I don't think you should have a different philosophy for what you charge from one thing to the next. And, 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 and there's a lot of things that are wrong with the music industry um, because of the way we look at how we're going to charge, right? And I think the way I have works better than just using your emotions or just going with the, the crowd. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, oh, oh, you know what? There is some big news this week. I did upload, and, and so this means it will probably be available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble within the next two, three weeks. There's a book that my wife and I did together. She did all the artwork. I did the, the music side of it where it's folk folk songs and some nursery rhymes in there. The, the idea is to have simple melodies and you have it a complete version um, in an easy key. Now this is for students who can play confidently up to three flats, three sharps. And what they do is they, they, they learn the one that has all the notes in the easy key. Then the next page, you flip the page, and it's in a, maybe two flats, two sharps, and um, there's notes missing, 
right? So it's been transposed for you, but some of the notes are missing. And when you get to the, I put question marks instead of notes. And when you get to those notes, um, you have to fill in the blank. So the, the, the book is called Trumpet Folk Fill in the Blank. I've ordered the proof copy. The proof copy should arrive sometime this week. And, um, and yeah, so that's, that's some exciting news. We, we wanted this to be out in time for Christmas because I think it's going to make a wonderful Christmas present. So anyway, you know what? We'll start with your question on hell. Um, Angel is asking, what is some advice to improve on my region music? So, you know, I teach seven stages of, of um, what I call literature prep. Literature is anything musical instead of exercises, right? So um, I teach seven stages. Now, if you are using the word improve, that means you probably already learned the music, okay? Now, unfortunately, my philosophy is if you didn't learn it right to begin with, then it will never, that particular piece of music will never be at your full potential. Don't, don't let that concern you. Um, most people do not play out their full potential, okay? So don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to scare you, but I do believe that if the music needs to be improved, that you probably didn't practice it right to begin with, and there's no going back, okay? When it comes to practicing music, th there is a, a myth when it comes to practicing music, um, people will that people think that the way practicing goes is that you jump in there, learn the music, and then fix the mistakes. And that is a complete myth. That does not that that there it's impossible to fix mistakes. If you learn the music wrong, all you can do at this point is change the percentage chance that it will be wrong in performance, okay? All you can do is change the percentage of a chance. There's still always a chance that what you learn wrong will, will come up in your performance, okay? I hope that makes sense. Um, so now, don't be discouraged. I've worked with plenty of students in the past that learn the music wrong, okay? Um, if you have to improve it, there are things you can do to help. The first thing you want to do is go... Now, so part of your answer is what I just said now. You can minimize the chance that this happens. Now, what's the difference between, between learning it right to begin with and minimizing the chance that it goes wrong in the performance? The difference between those two is just the amount of work you have to put into it. It is far more efficient to just do it right the first time, okay? The amount of work you have to invest to, quote, unquote, fix the problems, in other words, to make it so unlikely that you will make those mistakes in the performance, in the audition, that you can say, quote, unquote, you fixed the problem. It's a tremendous amount of work. It's a tremendous amount of work, okay? So here's what you have to do is you have to find those mistakes and isolate them and use the... Now, this doesn't work for everything. We want to use, let me say it in general first. Let's speak in general first. You want to use some sort of proven practice 
technique. Use some sort of proven practice technique to, to um, increase your odds, so to speak. Okay? All right. So, um, now, one of those techniques is the, the metronome method. Okay? Someone just called me. I'll have to see what that is. Um, so one of those techniques is a metronome method. You isolate the section that you're having trouble with. You put the tempo to half the tempo. Then you play that section 10 times perfectly before you turn the notch. And when I say turn the notch, you know, the, the, the metronome on your phone doesn't have these notches, okay? Take a look at this. Notice it doesn't go, okay, so that's not very focused. Okay, you can't see that. I'm sorry, you can't see that. The numbers on here, let's say your piece is supposed to be at 100, okay? You're going to go to half tempo, which is 50. Now, the next one up is not 51. If you do it like that, it's going to take you forever to fix. It takes forever already, right? It takes forever already. This is the only reason I don't use this technique for everything, is it's just way too slow, okay? But if you found yourself in a situation where you've already practiced the music, but you're playing it wrong, you can already play the whole etude, but you've got like eight different sections in the etude that you're playing wrong. The metronome method is the best method for that. Now, there are times when the metronome method is not appropriate. I would have to see you playing to know which of those things to prescribe. But most of the time, if you've already worked up the piece and you have sections that are not good, the metronome method is the best part, uh, best uh, uh, solution. So yeah, we go from 50 to 52. And it, improve, it increases in increments of two until you get to 60. Then it's increments of three, 63, 66, 69, 72. And then it's increments of four, 76, 80, 84, 88, 82. 96, 100, 104, 108, 112. See, so what we have with the, the digital metronomes is you can tell, you know, sometimes people will put metronome markings on their music and you can tell that they're like, you can tell their age, right? Because they didn't grow up with these, this kind of metronome. And they'll put metronome markings like 102 or 101. Well, that's not a mar metronome marking. That's not on the metronome, <laughs> right? So um, anyway, so yes, each time you do 10 times perfectly, you, you progress to the next marking on, the, on a real metronome. And you do that until you get to your full tempo. Then if you want to like, and this falls in the, the sixth stage. I remember I teach seven stages. The stage that, um, well, this actually isn't a stage. See, if you do my seven stages, you don't have to do what I'm telling you now. So if you do my seven stages and you're careful about doing the first and second stage, then you don't have to do this. Now, that said, there have been some of my students that have done this but weren't careful. Then we have to do this, right? Does that make sense? They did my seven stages, but they weren't careful in the first two stages. Then we have to do the metronome method. Okay, but it's actually pretty rare now because I don't have to sell this to my students anymore. They've seen it work. My seven stages work. And I don't have to convince them anymore. They just do it. 
and they are careful now most of them okay so um so yeah um so i hope that helps you the metronome method is probably the best bet for you okay tony asks do i have any trumpet and piano music and my answer is yes i do not much but i do um i have Let's see. I actually, you know what? I have a new piece that isn't finished yet. That's that I'm I'm going to orchestrate it first. Uh, I don't know which band I'm going to write it out for. Um, I would like to find a trumpet play. It's a trumpet solo, and I would like to find a band and a trumpet player to perform it. And until I know who's going to perform it i'm not going to orchestrate it um because i don't know what if it's a band or if it's an orchestra i'm kind of leaning towards a brass band but you know it, got, it could actually be multiple i could have different orchestrations but after it's orchestrated i'm going to condense it into a piano you know they have what do they call it piano um reduction uh, a piano reduction, and then that, that will essentially be a um, trumpet and piano piece. But I do have one that people like. Let me see if it's online somewhere real quick. It's called, if I'm not mistaken, Three Pieces. or th No, Three Songs or something like that. And it's got, you know, it ended up it ended up being a a sweet. It ended up being a sweet because I wrote three different pieces, and instead of, you know, let me check Sheet Music Plus real quick. Um, I don't know if it's up there. Anyway, it's 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 not a hard piece. I think it's harder for the piano. So let me tell you about my my um my problem with the um. The trumpet and piano stuff is that um, let's change this to 50. I'm not very confident writing for piano. And that's why I want to do a redo. After I finish the orchestration of this other piece, I will be doing a. Um, oh, here's some. Okay, that's what I was thinking. I do have three beginner pieces for piano. And, and I mean beginner. The reason I wrote these is because um, all the beginner pieces I could find were too hard for my students. I want the students to start playing solos and stuff like that from the very beginning. I don't want them to wait three, four months, five months. If they can play up to tuning note C and know what half notes and quarter notes are, and can play in one flat or one sharp. I want them to be able to play a solo. And it's so difficult to find a, a, a piano trumpet piece that meets that criteria. Either they'll have eight notes in it. I don't want eight notes at that stage. Or they'll have a range that goes above C. Or they'll have three flats or three sharps or whatever. And I don't I don't want those beginners to have that. I want them to have an opportunity to play something with a with a piano player. So I have three pieces like that, one for each key, uh, key of C, key of F, and key of G, our, our keys. Um, so I have those. But then there's that other piece that I'm talking about, and I'm not seeing it anywhere here. 
So what I'll do is I'll put this on my to-do list, make sure it gets put up. I think it's called Three Pieces or Three Songs, something like that. And they're, they're not like competitive type pieces. They're more musical. The second movement is sort of a, almost a um, minimalistic piece. The trumpet part is long, long, long notes, melodies, and um, and the piano part goes dee 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 doo dee 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 doo dee 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 doo dee 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 doo. Very almost hypnotic accompaniment. And then the 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 first movement I call Baby Jesus, and it's very song like. I can play the 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 melody for the Baby Jesus one. <laughs> That's the, the opening melody for that. And then the, the last movement is a kind of sort of, it's almost march-like, but it's not heavy. So that one goes like this. Oh, can't believe I forgot it. And what's weird about that one is the phrases are three bars each. So what you just heard, that's like a, a three-bar phrase. And then it, it goes be back and forth between. So that one's called Singing Along the Bayou, right? I wrote it back when I was living um, in Sage Glen, which is about... 10, 20 minutes north of where I live now. And um, we lived right next to the bio. And I used to take walks. This is back when I was fat. So um, at that time, I was almost 300 pounds. And to, to the, one of the first things I did to get my weight down was to walk. And I mean like four hours of walking every morning. And I would go to Glenbrook Park, which was then adjacent to my backyard back then. I would, and they had a walking trail at Glen, Glenbrook Park, and I would walk lap after lap after lap after lap, and it was so boring, right? And I would carry this, this um, index card in my pocket with a pencil, and if I had ideas while I was walking, I'd write them down. And that melody popped into my head while I was on one of those walks. That's why I called it Singing Along the Bayou, right? And um, yeah, so I, I wrote a song about that. I'm not, not about it. I wrote a song from that information and made it trumpet and piano. Now, um, I would like to say, now he... <laughs> My son has been having difficulty finding this, but my son wrote a wonderful piece for trumpet piano. I think he, if he were to um, invest himself into this, because he's a piano player primarily, but he's also a trumpet player. Um, but yeah, I, I think his trumpet and piano stuff is actually better than mine. Um, he's a, you know, I only gave him one composition lesson. It was an important lesson. Uh, I do teach composition. Uh, there are certain things I teach like almost to everybody and I gave him just one of those lessons about the seven, seven textures and how to move in and out from of the different seven textures. And this is something that's like, one of the cornerstones of my composition stuff. 
I used to do it as exercises. A lot of my compositions from the old days, um, I would on purpose hit every single seven textures, every single one of the seven textures in every composition. <laughs> now I don't do that anymore. Um, but the seven textures have become so much a part of how I write. It's like, I don't have to think about that anymore. Um, so anyway, I taught him just about the seven textures and just what else ever he knew and put into it. And uh, his, I've heard his piece, his trumpet and piano piece, and it's wonderful. Anyway, what I will do is try to get the, the trumpet piece up, trumpet and piano piece up on... Um, on both Sheet Music Plus and my website. And um, I'll try to do that within the next week. All right. So if there are, are no other questions, I want to go on to this other question that I got. Um, trying to figure out what you should charge if this is new to you. If you're, if you're new to the music business, um, I have a way of approaching what I charge, now there's a, a, a story behind it. Um, if this goes back to when I was first publishing my books, and, you know, I didn't have any help with the books. Really. That was all. I didn't have access to help. I had some people that might have said this or said that, you know, people who had advice. Um but really, that advice came from people that weren't doing this. So when I first published my books, I did, I didn't know what to charge, right? So I, I just looked at what other people were charging for similar books. And I charged that way. And the problem was, it was, I was losing money with every book. And that wasn't good. In fact, it got so bad that after a while, because, so, let me not jump, I, I, I shouldn't jump ahead. So when I, when I first started publishing the books, I was losing money. And it took me to go back later and do the numbers and say, oh, you're losing money, right? And so the way I figured out that price was by looking at, from a, an emotional perspective, what other books were were charging, right? What people were paying for other books. But they weren't using the same process as I was. I had to make every book by hand because that's all I had available to me. And when you do it that way, it costs a lot of money. So when I finally figured that out, um, the Daily Routines book, which is currently 1999, in the 90s and just past the new millennium, I was charging people $35 for a physical copy of that book. $35 and still losing money. So when you, when you look at pricing, it's wrong. It's so... You have to remember, that once you start talking about money, we're talking business now, okay? Once you start talking about money, we're talking about business. And it's wrong to charge less than what it costs you to make the product. It's wrong. There's nothing right about that, okay? It's not even a form of charity, <laughs> right? If that's your idea of charity, you're, you're kind of, you don't know what charity is, okay? There's nothing charitable about getting walked on and stomped on, okay? And basically self-humiliating, um, right? So the way you figure out the price is you look at what it costs you to make the product. 
And then you add 60% over the top of that. And, and it's not actually 60%. So what it costs you should only be 40% of what you charge. Okay, and there's a reason for that. That sounds, so to those of you who have never done anything like this before, that might sound extreme because, so, so you're thinking, man, that dude's ripping me off. But you have to do that. If you're, if you're talking business, because the people you sell, the, the people who, like, for example, my books are sold on Amazon. My books are sold on, um, and back in those days, my books were being bought by music stores and sold in the music stores. Well, the music store has to make a profit or they're not going to take your book. And what I found out um, early in, the, in this process, I found out that they don't like it if you charge less than they do. Which makes sense, right? They don't want you to charge less. So, so let's say you have a book that costs you just let's make it ten dollars just to make the math easier. A book costs you ten dollars to make. If you sell that book to a music store for twelve dollars, and then when some guy off the street buys it from you and you sell it to him for $12, the music store is not going to be happy about that because they have to charge $15. You see how that works? So this is where my idea of, of pricing has come from. It's, it's based on, number one, what it costs you to make the product. Number two, um, what the um, retailers need to make over and above what you make from the product. Okay? So there's, there's cost, there's wholesale, and there's retail. Those are three different prices. Okay, you, the, the, there are three different prices for a product. And if you, okay, so what am I saying? Oh, and today, if you don't have sales and specials and reduced price this and reduced price that, People won't buy your stuff because that's become, and it's a sham, right? We all know it's a sham, but now that's just the way it is. When you buy those can, that can of beans at the store, if you don't get it when it's on sale, you're paying too much for it because they artificially inflate the price so that when they have a sale, they don't lose any money. Now that's the whole of business today because that's that's just how it evolved, right? So you have to also in the price build a margin in there for sales. Okay, that's just the way the the all industries are in in the United States today. Everything is, is, is the, the, the markup has to include those, those different items, okay? So now, how does this now translate into, so I figured out for myself that the markup, now I say markup is 60%. When you do the math backwards, it's not 60%, okay? I don't remember what the percentage is, but in the end, you want the full price to be, you want the cost to be only 40% of the full price. 
okay? And otherwise, you know, let me say this. Before I go on to how this applies to lessons and gigs and writing work for that matter, right? You know, I also write music for people for a living. I I had to turn down a, a, a job that I've done for the last three or four years, and it really broke my heart to have to do that. Um, every year I've done their Christmas music, like all the, the music for their Christmas program, and um, this year I had to turn it down because there's just so much. Um, as you see, I've not posted a video on YouTube for two weeks, right? There's just too much going on right now, and I can't afford to do. But anyway, so um, before we talk about how this applies to those three things, um, how much you charge for lessons, how much you charge for writing work, how much you charge for gigs, let's, let's, let's talk about this one side topic a little bit, okay? Because I think it's wrong. Personally, now this is uh, this falls in the realm of opinion. I'm not saying that necessarily I'm the authority on this subject. There are going to be a whole bunch of people that disagree with me. There's a lot of people that will play gigs for less than what they should. Because, and, and, and here's the bottom line, it's because they just have to play music. I call this I call this um, music worship or trumpet worship specifically for trumpet players, but they just have to play. They've got there's something inside of them that will just go wrong if they don't play the trumpet. Okay, um, you know the way I see it, because a lot of those people have jobs, right? They've got day jobs. The way I see it, what they should be paying, what they should be holding out for, for gigs, is uh, the equivalent of what they would lose if they had to not do their job that day. That's, uh, well, let's say, for example, a gig is typically four hours long. Uh, um, so let's say a four hour gig. Let's so, so let's say your day job is an eight hour a day day job. What do you make in a day? And now well, I'm not talking about take home. I'm talking about your gross income for a day. Split that in half and that's what you should be charging on a gig. That's my opinion. Because that's what it costs you. That's how I see this. Now, I know that most people who have day jobs are not making that. They're making a whole bunch more money than what they're going to go out and play for a gig. But they have to play. And that's the problem, right? If they were to charge, if they were to hold out for that kind of money, they probably wouldn't get enough gigs. Something horrible would happen to them. If they didn't play, this is that religion, right? This music worship religion. If they don't play, something horrible is going to happen to them. And you know what? I think you have to decide what you want to do. Do you want to be an amateur or do you want to be a pro? If you're going to be a pro, treat it like a business and charge what it's going to cost you. Hello, Samuel. Charge what it's going to cost you. If you're going to be, if you're not going to charge what it's going to cost you, then you are an amateur, and I would prefer. This is my opinion. I'm not telling you what to do. That's all on you. But I would prefer that you don't charge anything. If you're going to be an amateur, go whole hog.
don't swim in that wishy-washy area in between that says, oh, I need to play so bad or something bad is going to happen to me, right? I just have to play my trumpet or something bad is going to happen. So I'm going to take this gig even though it pays about a third of what I would normally make if I was at work. That's not a professional. That's an amateur, but you're an amateur taking money from other people. And because you are doing this, because you have this almost sick desire to play the trumpet, you've created, you've, you've played your role in creating this scene where um, the supply and demand for trumpet players is so skewed that none of us can make any money. Samuel, I'll answer your question when I'm finished with this, okay? Um, so, yes, I think that you should... Choose one or the other. If you're going to treat it like a business, treat it like a business. If we had more people, if we had more trumpet players treating the music as a genuine business, our pay would go up. Okay? If we had more people, so now let's let's look at how what I said earlier about the products applies to because it's a, there's a slight difference because now we're talking about time, okay? We're not talking about physical products that have to be purchased first, okay? But we are talking about time that has to be invested. All right. So the way I figured out. And I did this wrong before. I went by emotions, even long after I figured out the thing with the books. Okay? I went by emotions. Um, I figured out what the prices would be by looking at what other people were paying, what other people were charging, and how I felt. Okay? That didn't work so well. Um, things were too out of whack. So I decided one time, one day, I, I guess about 15 years ago, that I was going to charge the same price for everything I do. Think about that. This is consistent with what I'm saying about making this a business, right? I'm going to charge the same hourly rate for everything I do. So, what does it cost me to do a gig? Well, if I have students that day, it costs me students. What does it cost me to teach a, a, a student? Well, if I have a gig op opportunity, but I choose to do the students anyway, it costs me a gig. If I have writing work to do for somebody, and I know it takes a certain amount of time to do that much writing. And by the way, when it comes to the writing, I actually measured how long it takes me to, to write per measure. I have a per measure rate that I charge based on how long it takes me to write that much music. Okay? I actually put it in a, a spreadsheet. And so someone says, can you write this song for me? I, I put down how long is the song in terms of minutes? What is the tempo? And um, whether it's 4-4 four, four or 3-4, because if you have those three things, you can figure out how many measures there are in the piece before you even write the piece. And you charge according to that. Right. If you charge, if you charge according to to 
And, you know, if you do the math, I guess that's what I'm saying. Do the math first and then figure out what you're going to charge. And I have. So per measure, I have a per measure rate. And I do offer sometimes, if it's something that looks very easy to me, I'll, so it's like 70, 75 cents per measure or something like that. I don't have it here in front of me. But I might sometimes give somebody a discount down to 50 cents a measure. That's the lowest I'll go is 50 cents per measure. Um, so I'll give someone a discount like that because I just know that it's not going to take me as long. Okay, so if you apply that now to uh, what you're going to charge for lessons, it should be based on what it is you're making outside of lessons. You know, I have a, 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 an arrangement that I wrote about three years ago. And... This is not something that I wrote for somebody else. This is something I wrote for my own library. And I sell it. And as of now, if you were to add both sources, I sell it in two different places. If you were to add it, add both sources income, I've made so far uh, about $150. Now that's something that I, that's basically royalty money. But hear me out. I've made $150 so far in three years. Now the nice thing about this is it's long term. If I, if I broadcast that over the next 20 years, that piece of music will have made me a lot more than what a gig will ever pay. For that amount of time does that make sense and that doesn't even include performance royalties so like you know i got a, a a huge royalty check one one year because one of my compositions was performed in france on the tv so i got a it was a, i'm assuming it was just a single performance uh, but I got a huge check, huge in terms of like what you make when you write music, okay? Huge for me compared to like this other piece I'm talking about. But yes, there are performance royalties. If, if, if the song is played on the radio or on the TV or even here on YouTube, I get tiny YouTube royalties every time you click on one of my songs on YouTube, uh, I get royalties for that. Whether and it's whether it's my video or not, you could you could record it, put it up, and I'm supposed to make royalties off of your YouTube video. Okay. So, um, but my point is, is that if I'm not doing that, that's costing me future income. So I have to take that into account when I'm figuring out what I have to charge for lessons. I have to take that into account when I figure out what is my minimum for gigs. Now, I don't charge people for gigs. The gig pays what the gig pays, right? The leader can't say, well, let me bargain with Eddie. The, the, when the leader signed the contract for the gig, the money was already set. So now he's looking for a trumpet player for that gig. So it's not that I charge a higher rate for that leader. What it, what, what it comes down to is that when that leader calls me for a gig that doesn't pay enough, I say, no, thank you. That's how that works. Okay, so and that's how it should be for you. Now I can't tell you what to 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 charge. I can't tell you what to charge. All I can do is tell you to look at what kind of money you make already. If you're just starting out and you don't make any money, then I would say get a job. <laughs> 
No, I'm serious. Actually, I think if you're not making it, unless someone's going to give you, unless you can get enough lessons now to make a living, you need to get a job and base it off of those, off of the job that you get. So if you're not, does that make sense? Otherwise, you could be contributing to a situation that is not very good. Anyway, let's let's move on from that. If anyone has any more questions about the business side of it, I have plenty to say <laughs> about business, right? And some of it is actually quite controversial. This stuff that I'm saying about amateurs, okay? I don't have a problem with amateurs. I love working with amateurs. But if you're going to be taking gigs, you should be charging according to what you are lo losing by taking the gig. Now, you can justify and say, well, I'm not losing anything. But if you make, <laughs> if you make, let's say you make a thousand dollars a day at your job, and I know most of you don't, but let's say hypothetically you make a thousand dollars a day at your day job, you should actually be playing for free. I'm sorry. That's how I see it. And I know a lot of people would disagree with me. All right. With region coming up, this is Samuel. With region coming up, do you have any advice on how to stand out in the audition? The most important thing is to have the best sound that you can possibly have. Forget about the show-off stuff, right? Forget about whether or not you can play high. Forget about whether you can play fast. Forget about stuff like playing loud. The judges, typically speaking, the judges don't care about that stuff. Okay, typically. I've heard rumors about some. But more typically here in Texas, I can't speak for other states, but more typically in Texas, it's the sound. It really is the sound that, that makes you stand out. Now, I personally like, if I was the judge, over and above sound, if you want to stand out with me, you want to um, be more expressive. But I was just listening to a, a, a podcast the other day about how that works, right? Being more expressive actually works to your disadvantage if there is a panel instead of a single judge. Because today it's far more, it's far, far easier to offend somebody. Think about it, right? Think about how the world works. I'm going to tell you something about me and restaurants, because I grew up uh, living all over the world, kind of, all over the country, and my tastes, I don't like middle-of-the-road tastes when it comes to food. I like the food to taste like what it is. So, for example, if it's hot, I want it to be hot. If it's greasy, I want to be greasy, not sort of greasy. I want it to be greasy, <laughs> right? If it's got Indian flavors, I want it to taste like Indian food. If it's going to be Mexican, I want it to taste like Mexican. I don't want it to be middle of the road. And for that reason, my favorite restaurants have a tendency to close down. Let that sink in. All of my favorite restaurants over the last, um, now I don't, we don't eat out a lot. I stopped eating fast food in the 90s with only a very few exceptions, right? I think I'd be exaggerating if I said once a year. I don't think we do quite, I don't think we even do once a year fast food. I might be wrong, but I, I'd be surprised if we do more than once a year, okay? So we go to restaurants 
if and when we go out. We don't we we don't go out much, but especially compared to the typical American, um, <laughs> typical American probably eats out about ten to twenty times more than 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 me and Pearl do. Okay, so but that said, when we do eat out, we tend to go to places that have food that tastes like what it is not middle of the road stuff so we don't go to chilies um we don't go to places like that um those huge um what do you call it chains restaurant chains we don't go to those because they have to go middle of the road because of what i'm talking about this is why i'm talking about this the standing out thing if you stand out you run the risk of offending somebody. If you stand out, see, you have to stop thinking in terms of this, like, strated, uh, uh, um, stratification, right? That there's one single line of who, good and bad and the best top players at the top and the worst players at the bottom. That's not how it works. That is not how it works. That's how everyone wants you to think it works because they have more control over you when you think that way. But that's not how it works. If you do something that stands out to me, it's likely to offend somebody else. And this is something I learned from this. It's a trumpet podcast, right? And the guy was talking about the difference in auditions for the orchestras today than it was back in the old days. In the old days, it was better to stand out because you weren't auditioning for a panel. You were auditioning for an individual. And you so when you stood out, you either, they either really liked you or they didn't like you at all. With a panel, that changes the dynamics. And in the Texas auditions, we, we have five judges. So, yes, I still think, that said, I still think that being better at the expressive stuff gives you an edge in the competition. But there's it's, it's a dangerous edge because, because it could backfire on you and get you. I had a student last year who was one of the best, uh, uh, you know, as far as high school students, he was the best jazz student I've ever had so far. Very proud of that. Very, very proud of that student. I'm very, very proud of him, right? Because where he's going with the music, he's not my student anymore because he graduated. He's at college now. But where he took the music was to such a high expressive level. And when you do that, you connect to people. And that's the edge that I'm talking about. If you go in there and you connect to them, musically speaking, you know, connect to their, to, to their soul, you have an edge, but that edge can backfire on you. Because it's, it's easy. So this the reason I brought up this student, the best, most expressive jazz high school student I ever taught in my whole career. And he didn't make region. Didn't make region jazz. And that's something I couldn't understand until I heard this podcast. And now, now it makes sense. So if you are extremely expressive, It's easier to offend somebody in the process, okay? If you are extremely expressive, it's easier to offend somebody. So I still think being expressive is the best way to get an edge. 
Now, what is expressive? We're talking about learning how to phrase. If you don't know what a phrase is and if you're not doing and a phrase is not, so let's let's straighten this out. A phrase is not just where you breathe. Okay? That's not what phrasing is. Phrasing is, and you can look it up on my, I have a video about it. I think if it's not there, please email me and on my website and let me know and I'll make sure I put one up. Um, but I teach poetic phrasing. And what I call poetic phrasing. And it has to do with intensity. So, so the as you progress through the phrase, the intensity gets higher. And then you have a, uh, the climax and then you have the resolution. Each phrase should have that. Also part of expression is your style, your vibrato, note lengths, note, note articulation styles. Uh, also part of expression is, um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, yes, so the mostly phrasing and style, those are the most important things. And you know what? I have seen students that just for whatever they, for whatever reason, couldn't get the kind of sound that they needed to be competitive, and they still won all state, and they still won all region because they were more expressive. Because when you're more expressive, it makes it more pleasing to the ear, and uh, the harsh sound isn't as harsh. I hope that makes sense. And that's why I say it gives you an edge. When you make a personal connection with the judge, I had one student that made Allstate and um, at, when they did the, the area test, area audition, one of the judges hunted him down afterwards. One of the judges hunted him down afterwards and, and had to shake his hand. And the judge said, you touched my heart. That's what you want. So no, it's not so much that you... In classical music, if we talk about being overly expressive, we're talking about stuff like having a vibrato that's too wide. And that might be part of your sound, but if you have a very, very wide vibrato, um, uh, okay, so I remember the, the, the middle etude. If you have a vibrato like this, I'm, I'm over-exaggerating, but if you have a, a, an extremely wide vibrato or even a slow vibrato, right? We want to have the expression, but we don't want to be. So when we talk about expression, the 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 mold is broken when you're expressive, right? You break the mold. You're not just one of the cookies from the cookie cutter. You're now something different. And that's where it gets kind of dangerous, right? Because if you're too different, it will offend somebody. So I'm not saying don't be... So the, the wording that you have there is, is what I'm having a problem with. It's because you can't phrase too much, okay? That's not possible to phrase too much, all right? That's not possible. Okay? We, in the classical stuff, we just don't want to be too far outside of what the norm is. Now, it's different for a solo contest. 
solo contest, we can be more outside the norm. Because that's just one judge. So, yes, Tony, you're right. Compensation in the arts. Pearl and I were just talking about that yesterday. We were, we were seeing something from the 50s. And I told her, I said, you know, oh, I know what it was. We were watching one of the James Bond movies from the 60s. That's what it was. And great trumpet playing in that, right? And I told her, I said, back then, all the movies had trumpet. All the shows had trumpet on TV. All the radio programs had trumpet. The the all the people getting married had trumpet. I told her back then you didn't have to be famous. Back in the 60s, you didn't have to be famous, you just had to be good. If you were good enough, you got gigs. That's not how it works today. That's not how it works today. Today, if you're good enough, that's just the first step. Now you have to do all this other stuff. And the, and the reason for that is the trumpet gigs went away. We don't have as many performance opportunities as we did today. And yet, I'm not afraid to bet we have more trumpet players trying to play professionally today than we did in the 60s. In fact, probably exponentially more. I'm going to bet. I, I don't have numbers to prove this, but I'm, I'm not afraid to bet that we probably have hundreds more, hundreds times more professional trumpet players today than we did back then, back when there were jobs. So, yes, you're right, Tony. So, yeah. So, yes, uh, Samuel, if you, if you phrase, there's no such thing as, as too much phrasing, okay? There is such a thing as too much vibrato. There is such a thing as tonguing too hard or tonguing too soft. There is such a thing as notes that are too short or too long. That's the stuff that we want to be middle of the road on. For fear of offending somebody. I know someone who judges who likes all the notes to be super, super long. I know someone who judges who likes all of the notes to be super, super short. short. Okay, well, that's good. If your tone is your best asset, then that's, that's a good thing. That's always a good thing. Some people never get that. All right. So any other questions before I close down today? My student that I've been teaching at this time has marching contest today. So that's why I'm going a little longer than usual. Um, uh, so we'll be... Picking, with, picking up with him again next week. Now, I'm going to remind you guys one more time. Um, no Q&A on the 16th for sure. I believe the week after that also. Wouldn't that be the 23rd? Um, the 23rd, let me tell you about this. I used to be a member of the Ed Gerlach Orchestra. Ed Gerlach passed away this this last week, um, and they're having a memorial for him on the 23rd. I'll be playing lead with the Edgar Lack Big Band on at his memorial uh, in the morning of the 23rd. So um, when I was in the Gerlach Band, it was after they stopped getting gigs. <laughs> so. It was kind of good because it wasn't as like, you know, that band used to get five or six gigs a week. When I was playing with them, they barely had two or three a month. 
Um, but I was in the band. I started af started off as the third trumpet player. And then when Dennis Dotson left the band, I took his chair. Um, while Dennis was still in the band, I used to sub on lead when Buddy Sisko couldn't make it. So um, I've played all three of those chairs uh, quite a bit. I'm familiar with all three, all three books. And I, I'll tell you what, I miss playing with that band. I can't tell you how much I miss playing with that band. Um, he closed down the band, I think, about 10, 15 years ago um, due to his health. I think he was also tired of the treatment. I remember one gig, one of, the, one of our last gigs, um, the people were very abusive towards him, and he just... I can imagine that, right? You get to a certain age, and when people are abusive to you, you just, why? Why keep doing it, you know? Why do you keep doing it? And I, I can imagine why he would have closed the band down. But he was also getting up in years. You know, he was 99. He was 99 when he died. So maybe it's been more years than just 15. I think he was in the 70s when he when he when he stopped the band but yes i played with that band for about 20 years and uh it was in terms of big band it was the highest quality band i ever worked with by far the highest quality band the the members of the band were uh all <laughs> yeah he he had a great career yeah, you know, he started off as an arranger for Glenn Miller, if I remember right. He also had a, a, a band here in um, the Houston area before the war, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, and, and he, he kept the band going until he was in his 70s. He had friends in, you know, like... Uh, what that guy, Walt, Walt Stewart was a friend of his. A bunch of those big band writers were friends of his. And we had a bunch of handwritten charts in the book from Walt Stewart and guys like that. Um, and yeah, so for me, that was, that was an amazing experience to, to be part of that. Anyway, if there are any other questions, we'll answer those now. Otherwise, we'll shut down for the day. Um, thanks for hanging out with me, everybody. And so um, I think we have one. We have a question and answer session next week, and then it gets sparse after that. All right. So if you have questions. Masala walk. Okay, I'll have to check that out. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> what side of town is? Uh, oh wait, so I don't know what even what town, what what city you live in. So anyway, well, that's what I'm talking about with the food. I like food that tastes like what it is. You know. Oh okay. Very good. All right. So anyway. We'll see you guys next week. God bless you. And thanks for hanging out with me. Um, take it easy till next time. All right. I'll check it out then. Thanks. All right. Bye.